Good evening, my Pleasant Hill family, and all of those who decided to join in with us tonight, amen, for Bible study. We thank God for you. We thank God, amen, that today has been a beautiful day, a cold day, just like yesterday. But the only thing is, we know that God is in control, amen, of the weather, the sun, the rain, or anything that's happening. So we thank God for the day being as good as it is. So I pray that you are ready for the night to hear what God will share unto us. I pray that you have had a blessed day at work or if you're teleworking from home, amen, that you have enjoyed your day, um, giving back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And now we want to render unto God what belongs to God. And that's our time with him on tonight. Uh, before we get to our start tonight, let me just say, I want to thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Gibson for the word on Sunday. Will you give her a great big hand clap of praise? Give us a thumbs up or send us some smiling faces just to let her know, amen, how much we appreciate the word that she gave us on Sunday. That was a powerful word called focus, amen, amen, focus. That meant that um, you have ocular clarity plus mental concentration. So we thank her for that word, amen. We thank her for blessing us in a special way. We thank her for um, teaching us, amen, on how to stay focused. Because in this year and in this season, we're going to need clarity. We're going to need focus. Amen. So we want to bless the Lord for her. Amen. For giving us that. Um, then I'm really excited. I'm really excited about coming back in for worship on this coming Sunday. Amen. This coming Sunday at the 10 o'clock hour, February the 7th. I pray that you are excited as well. Amen. As we come in to lift up the name of Jesus. It's been a long time. Amen. It's been practically a year since we've been um, not having in-person worship, and we are ready, we are excited, and I'm looking forward, not just, you know, to, to be in this place, but to see your smiling faces in this place, amen, and to be able to lift up the name of Jesus, saturate this place, amen, with his presence, amen, and to enjoy that which God has set us for, set us up for in this coming year. Praise the Lord. So please, ma'am, please, sir, come out. Be prepared. We'll still be social distancing ourselves. We'll still be wearing our face masks, face coverings, and we're going to still make sure that everybody is sanitizing their hands, uh, doing temperature checks and all of those things that we need to, to ensure we're providing a safe environment for you to be able to worship in. So if you're sick or having any symptoms or have been around some people who may have contracted uh, the disease, we're asking you to please stay at home. It's okay. But for those of you who are ready to worship, and those of you who are being safe, amen, come on out and let's have a great time in the Lord. Amen. I'm excited. I'm excited. And I pray that you are excited too, amen, for what God will do and what God will say. That way we get an opportunity to see each other's face. Amen. Because the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So we're looking forward, amen, to assembling ourselves to do what thus says the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then let us move forward, amen. Want to encourage you, want to encourage you, because this coronavirus is still very dangerous. It's still having spikes up and down. As you go out, as you go to and fro, do your part, amen, in being safe. The vaccines are being made available. Uh, right now, there's at the tier one, tier two levels, amen, for the um, healthcare workers, those who are over 65 and some others. And then they're asking some for even volunteers who would like to take the vaccine. Do your best, do your best in taking the vaccine. We can't make anybody or force anybody, but I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to take the vaccine, amen, to ensure that you are being inoculated away from this virus, amen, and making sure that you are safe for others around you, amen, that this disease don't continue to spread. Praise the Lord. And if we do that, I guarantee you, everything will be all right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's pray and then let's get down into the word on tonight, amen. Father God, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you have made. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for an opportunity to come out and to share what you have given us for tonight. God, bless your people in a special way. Open up their hearts and their minds to receive that which you would give. We know your word says your word shall not return unto you, Lord. So God, bless your people in a special way. Cause them to not only be hearers of your word, but cause them to be doers of your holy and written word. We bless your name on tonight, Lord. It is in your son Jesus' name that we do pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Well, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Bless the Lord. Turn with me real quickly to um, James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter, verses 22 through 25. And tonight we're going to cover quite a few scriptures, so I pray you have a 
pen and pencil in your hand, amen, if you're so you can take some notes. And if we go a little fast, you can go back and read it at your own leisure, amen, so you will have it in your spirit and you'll have some notes um, for you to be able to use at a later time. Praise the Lord. In James, the first chapter, verses 22 to 25. And you there, you'll find these words written. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But, so who, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We want to talk tonight in this same series that we've been talking on for the last uh, three or four weeks about the Word series. And tonight we want to talk about the Word of God, part three. The Word of God is clear. Hallelujah. The Word of God is clear. Just like you look into a mirror and see yourself. You want to make sure that you are seeing clearly. Even as Dr. Gibson spoke of last week, we want to make sure that there's clarity in what we see. Amen? Ocular clarity. I want to make sure we look at these things, we know what we're looking at. And then in God's word, we want to make sure that there's mental clarity because God speaks clearly. Even though there's interpretations, even though there's different um, versions of what the word of God says, you need to be clear about what God's word says and clear about what God says unto you. Praise the Lord. That's why it's difficult sometimes when you ask other folk, you know, what does this mean? Or what does God, what do you think God is saying to you? You ought to know what God is saying to you because he's speaking directly to you. The word of God speaks clearly unto us and we have to make sure we take God's word and apply it to our life and walk according to God's word. In James, the first chapter, it really begins to tell us, it's like um, we can use the, the Nike verse if we can. It, it says to us, just do it. Because it says, be ye a doer of the word. So Nike has a great slogan that says, just do it. And if we would look at this James as he says for us to just do it, do what it says. Don't try to, um, figure out a whole lot of other things that you can add to it or take away from it. Just do what it says. You will be blessed in what you do if you do what the word tells us to do. Amen, somebody. Don't just listen to it. It says, don't just be a hearer of the word and not a doer, but be a hearer as well as a doer of the word. Almost every Bible study, almost every Sunday service, I always say, God, don't allow us to just be hearers of your word, but cause us to be doers of your word. Because hearing the word and not doing it doesn't benefit us at all. So we want to make sure that if, as we hear God's word, we do God's word. It will make us better Christians and better able to expound and to share God's word when we know it and when we do it. Yes, God. And then go with me real quickly, amen, because looking in this spiritual mirror that James was talking about, it helps us to see who we are. And when you see who you are, you're better able to help somebody else. If you look at your own face and see the flaws and don't change the flaws or the, um, the errors you have in your face, it's going to be challenging when you look at somebody else and try to begin to change them and they're looking at your own flaws. So if you look at the mirror, the spiritual mirror, and correct the things that are in your life, then it's easier when you look at someone else's life to be able to help them change the errors and the flaws that are in their life. Praise the Lord. So James said, don't just look at it and walk away and forget what you saw. Glory to God. A lot of times we have errors, we have flaws, and we don't want nobody to know about them, so we just act like we didn't see it. You know you got a flaw. You know there's an error. You know there's a shortcoming. You know it more than anybody else. Hallelujah. God knows it. And so what we're asking you to do is you fix it and then continue to walk in the way God has called you to do. Praise the Lord. Let's go to John, the 12th chapter, and the 47th verse. John, the 12th chapter, and the 47th verse. Praise the Lord. 
John the 12th chapter 47 and 48 and it says if any man hear my word and believe not I judge him not for I came not to judge the world but to save the world he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him the word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day Wow, that, that's powerful. That's powerful. God is bound by his word. God is just, God is fair, and God is loving, but God is bound by his word. Jesus says in these scriptures that I did not come in the world to judge you. I came to save you. But not only did I come to save you, I gave you the word. And that's what we're talking about. The word of God. I was the living word. I gave you me. Watch this. Watch this. When I went away, I sent the comforter back to you to continue to reveal unto you who I was or who I am. And now, Father, watch what he says. And this is careful. He says, I will not judge you. But in the last day, you will be judged by my word. God Almighty. He said, I came to save you, but I gave you my word. And then by giving you my word, in the last days, whether you right, wrong, or indifferent, the word will be the judge on how you live your woo! The word's gonna judge you. People can say anything they want to say, do anything they want to do, but the word will be judged on whether you in the end or not. He says, I came into the world to save the world. Not to judge the world. But my word, the word of God, it will be the judge in the last day. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. The, the, if you study the textbook and live according to the textbook, you'll pass the test. Let's go to Hebrews 9 and 27 real quick. Hebrews 9 and 27. Glory to God. Hebrews 9 and 27 says this. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. As I just said, Jesus didn't come to judge you. He came to save you. But the word of God will judge you. We will be graded on a scale of pass or fail. Now, you need to listen to this clearly. We will be graded on a scale of pass or fail, whether you get in or not. The, the, the Bible is so clear. There won't be, uh, you won't be graded on what we call a, a curve. Hallelujah. You won't, you won't have an opportunity to get a makeup exam. Everything we do now, amen, is what's going to help you get into the kingdom. You can't go back and say, I need to have a retest. All your testing, all the things that's going to be done has to be done here because when you breathe your last breath, glory to God, you're going to either be in or out. You'll pass or fail. I know some of us been in school where the teacher's grade on the curve. When you miss a real short and they come and say, let me do all I can to, to help you pass. There will not be a curve in hell. Either you make it in or you don't. It's either heaven or hell. I, I hate to be that direct, but that's just the truth. That's what the Bible says. There won't be any, oh, I messed up and, and how can I get it? Get it right now. This is the opportunity for us to fix whatever our flaws are so that we understand God's word, live according to God's word, so that in the last day, in the end times, we are assured that we're going home with him. We are sure that we're going to pass the test. Study the textbook, live according to the textbook, and I guarantee you, heaven shall be your home. Praise the Lord. I, I hope that didn't hurt you, but I want to make sure you got that because that's critical in the life that we're living now. Because the world is telling us so, the world is so deceptive, and people are going and doing just about anything, but we as Christians, we as believers, we have to live according to the word. 
Um, when we talked about it um, a couple of weeks ago, we said that in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's good for us for reproof, for in correction, and for instructions in righteousness. And I found a scripture that's going to help us pull all of that together so you can kind of see for yourself um, how does this work? I hear what you're saying, but as I read the scripture, how do I apply it to my life? How do I know these things are applicable for me? I want to tell you tonight that the word of God is clear. When God speaks, it's clear. The flaw is in man that man misinterprets or hears the pieces that he want to hear and follow some and don't follow others. We have to follow the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Hallelujah. I know there are some great scriptures in there that we just jump and we shout about, but then there are some challenging, difficult scriptures that we ought to want to just, oh, let's act like it don't exist. Let's just forget that one. Amen? But they're all applicable to our life, and we have to live accordingly. Glory to God. The scripture I want to push you to tonight is in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter. And I'll stay here for just a few minutes because I think it's important. First Samuel, the 15th chapter, let me just, if I can, start at the end of the chapter. Then I'll find my way how I will back up to the beginning. In verse 35 of First Samuel, the 15th chapter, it says this. Then Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul and the Lord repented or regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. I want to say to you, knowing God's word is clear, have God ever said something to you that you did not do that made God repent or regret that he wanted you to do it? Glory to God. Has, has God ever been so good to you, promoted you, done some great with you, and then based on what you did, God rejected, repented, or regretted the fact that he had did it. Oh, I, I know that's tough. I know that's tough. Okay, well, let me just back up and tell you how we got to this particular point. Well, God repented or God rejected or God regretted the fact that he made Saul king. In this biblical time, there was no king. There was judges that judged Israel. But because other folks had kings, Israel wanted a king. And God made Saul king over all Israel. He was the first king made over all Israel. In Saul's own eyes, Saul says he was little, he was a nobody, but God chose him to be king over all Israel. Now let's go back to the first verse in chapter 15. It says that Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. I would love to stay here, but I, but I got to run tonight. Samuel tells Saul, Saul, God has called you to be king over it. Even though in your own eyes you said you are nobody, you are a little thing, God called you to be king over all Israel. And all you got to do is listen and hearken, do what the Lord said do. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember that when Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Woo! God gives specific instructions God gives a specific word in what he's calling Saul to do. He spells it out. It's clarity. There's no mistake. There's no um, trying to dis 
understand what God said. He made it clear. Specific instructions on what you ought to do. Look at verse 4. So guess what? Saul said, okay, I'm going to do it. Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tilium, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah, 10,000 soldiers. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. He, he waited on them, preparing to ambush them so he could utterly wipe out the entire tribe of the Amalekites. The Amalekites. And Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, get ye down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Verse 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Hebelah until the, until it cometh to Shur, that is over against Egypt. Watch this, watch this. Now here is where it's challenging to me. Here is where it's a little difficult to me. The word was clear to Saul what he was supposed to do. Saul made up in his mind, I'm going to do what the Lord said do, and he went with haste to get it done. Somewhere along the way, we get to verse 8. It changes. Watch verse 8. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep, of the oxen, of the fattening, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile, everything that was refuge, they did utterly destroy. What I'm trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if there's something in your life that you don't want, you'll get rid of that. If there's something in your life that's that's vile or uh, despising, you, you, you'll throw that away in a minute. But watch this. The things that were good, the things that they liked, the things that they desired and wanted to hold on to, even though God say utterly destroyed all of it, they held on to it. They kept the king Agag alive. They kept the good things, they kept the fat things, they kept everything that was good that they thought were good. They held it even though God said destroy it. How do we get so arrogant in life that God's word tells us one thing and we decide or we determine I'm going to do something different. Now don't let me hit your heart tonight because I know it's Bible study. But how many of us God has told to utterly destroy, to get rid of, to tear down, to throw away, to get rid of something and we decide this is good. I'm going to keep this. This is beneficial. I'm going to keep this. this. I'm still getting joy out of it. So if God said get rid of it but we decide somewhere else I'm not going to obey God. I'm not going to hear what God has said. So God's word was clear. He said destroy it but at some point and I know I'm talking to somebody tonight God has said get rid of it but you decided I'm going to hold on to it. Glory to God. Let's, let's push a little farther. Verse 9 but Saul and the people decided they would keep all these things that they said were good. Mm. Then this is the bad part. When they decided that they was going to keep it, even though the instructions of God said get rid of it, God says, I'm going to reject him. I'm going to uh, repent that I even made Saul king over all Israel. I chose him when he said he was nothing. I picked him when he said, I'm just a little thing. And put him over all Israel that he may follow my word and do those things I have commanded him. And now he's done just the opposite. Verse 10 said, Samuel, the prophet who gave Saul the word, came and said this. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel saying, it repented me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. Woo. 
And then verse 12, let me, just, let me just read it to you. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set him up a place and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. Now ain't this, ain't this amazing? God gave you instructions, told you what to do. You didn't follow God's instruction. And now you are arrogant when you thought you were nobody. Now you big headed when you thought you at first you was nothing. God gave you greatness. God made you king. And now you disobeyed God and you running around bragging about how good you are. You running around bragging how great. God told you, do not divorce your wife. Do not leave her just because she gained a few pounds. But you left her anyway and went out and married this little young, cute, hearty, a hoochie. And now you run around bragging about it. You better obey the word of God and stick with the word of God if you want to be successful. If you want to stay in the righteousness of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But watch this. Let me go a little farther. After Samuel got up early in the morning and went and talked to Saul, look, look at what happens down here in verse uh, 13. Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to Samuel, watch this, blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Ain't that funny? Samuel comes to Saul. Saul gives him accolades saying, blessed be thou of the Lord. I did what God told me to do. You see how the world will deceive us and how we sometimes even deceive ourselves? Samuel comes to Saul. Saul gives Samuel accolades and tells him, I did what the Lord told me to do. He's being deceived. And the funny thing about this is sometimes we think we're funny. And everybody knows we're not funny. But we keep on telling jokes. You just deceiving yourself that you're funny and know you're not. Nobody laughing but you think you are deceiving yourself. You, 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 you've been bamboozled. Everybody know you ain't funny except you. Hallelujah. You just keep on telling jokes. And nobody, that ought to be a sign. Nobody laughing at nothing you say. You're being deceived. Glory to God. And Samuel told Saul, hallelujah. Mm, you did everything the Lord told you to do. This, this next verse is going to just knock you out. Watch this. Saul says, I did everything the Lord told me to do. I followed his commandment. Watch how smooth Samuel coming back at him. In verse 14, and Samuel says, what meaneth then this bleeding of sheep in my ear and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? God told you to kill all the ox, all the sheep, all the duck, and all the ass. God told you to kill everything, but I hear moo, moo. What, what do you mean you did what God told you to do? And I hear some bleeding of sheep in my ear. What do you mean you did what God told you to do? And all of this stuff I still hear in the background. That's how we are today. Oh, I did what God told me to do. God told you to stop smoking cigarettes. God told you to get off drugs. God told you to stop drinking. But what is this that's emitting from your body? I smell the smoke. I smell the alcohol. The signs of drugs on your fingertips and on your lips and in your eyes. And you said, I've done what God told me to do. Woo! I'm coming at you a little hard, but it's Bible study. You can take it. Told yourself, God told you, cut off being with that woman. You said, I cut it up. Then why your phone still ringing all times at night? Glory to God. Be careful when you said, I've done God what you told me to do. But the evidence said, moo, moo. I still hear sheep. I still hear cows. But you said you killed them all. Parent, the evidence is not on your side. Because what I hear and what you say don't add up. Don't, 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 let, don't let me hit you too hard. I'm, I'm going to push a little farther. Watch this. Saul goes farther to say this. They have brought back from the Amalekites the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of everything to sacrifice unto the Lord. What? The, I'm trouble, y'all. Y'all going to have to work with me. Saul is king. 
But he tells Samuel, the people, the people brought back the bet. How can you be king and you start blaming it on everybody else? How come you won't take responsibility? You are the king, but you said the people brought back. But they brought it back because they was going to sacrifice it unto the Lord when we got the kill game. That is not the instruction of the Lord. You got to know what God told you. And you got to stick with what God told you. Don't let nobody confuse you about what God said. See, the people, they brought back the spoils. Hallelujah. That, that's, that's the biggest story that you can ever tell. Because one, and I'm going to just go there. When you are a leader, the people follow the leader. Glory to God. The people do what they see you do. The people do what you are allowed to be done. When you are the leader of the household, your children and your family follow you. When you are the leader of the ministry, the ones behind you, they follow you. The leader is in charge. They do what you allow them to do or what they see you do. The leader sets up the rules. The leader sets up the path. Hallelujah. The leader establishes the way that they ought go, and when they don't go that way, they are not following the leader. They're doing what the leader allowed them to do. Ah, whew. I better hold on to some of this. Y'all getting me excited. But I'll go a little further. In all of this, Saul wants to blame the folk. But Samuel says unto Saul, the King James Version says, Stay, S T A Y. I think the NIV and some of the other versions say he said, uh, "Be quiet." Um, but I'll just bring it to twenty twenty one. He says to the king, "Shut up." He looks. Watch this now. Be careful because the king has the authority and the power to kill you right there. But Saul the prophet, I mean Samuel the prophet, he tells the king, "Shut up." You blaming all of this stuff on the people. But you are the leader. You are responsible. God gave you the instructions. Ah. Uh, so you got to be careful. Samuel went on to tell him, the Lord has rejected you because you rejected his word. And it was so bad that the Lord repented or the Lord regretted. Now, not repent, not in the sense that we use the term repent, meaning turning from your wicked ways and not going that way again, doing a 180 degree turn. When the Lord says repented in this text, or when the Lord said regret it, that means he was sorrowful. He had feelings and emotions that he was sorry that he had made Saul king. God knows everything from the beginning even to the end. But he still allowed Saul to be king. Just like he do us. Put us in positions thinking we're going to do the right thing. And guess what? Some of us don't. And I guarantee you, it makes the Lord sorrow that he put us in a position and we did not follow his word. We did not hold true to his commandments. And so he repented. He regretted the fact that he put you there and you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Glory to God. He gives man a choice. He gives man a will. And you have to follow God's word. Hallelujah. The, the one thing that I'm trying to tell you tonight is you got to make a commitment to be willing to follow God's word to put everything in God's hand. I chose this scripture so it can show you how um, he gave reproof to Saul. He gave corrections to Saul. And then out of the instructions that he gave Saul to show him his word is clear. It points to the fact Saul made a decision that I was not going to follow the word of the Lord. It says, and the thing I think that bothers me the most is that Saul and the children of Israel said that we would not utterly forget what we had done. It, it, it bothered me because the Bible uses the term unwilling. Amen, somebody. Unwilling is a, is a type of attitude. Amen. To just say that I didn't want to do what God said. They was unwilling to obey the word of God. When you are unwilling, it's not that you don't have the capacity to do it. 
It means that your attitude and your hard heartness or your pride or your selfishness cause you to do something other than what you still have power to do. It just meant you didn't want to do it or you weren't willing to do it. Not that you could not do it. Woo! Glory to God. And there are a lot of things in life that we couldn't do. But we choose not to. There's a lot of things in life that we can forego. But we choose not to. And when it comes to the word of God, we cannot forego the word of God. We got to choose to follow the word of God. Because the word of God is clear. You don't have to try to figure it out. You don't have to go and ask no question about it. Read it for yourself and get it. Get it down in your moral. Get it down in your bones. So you'll know what God is saying to you. And then you can walk according to God's word. Don't just hear the word like Saul did. Be a doer of the word. Glory to God. Because if you just hear it and you don't do it, even as James said, it's like a man looking in the mirror, seeing the flaws, seeing the mistakes, and walking away and forgetting what he saw. Don't forget the word of God. Don't forget that the word of God is clear. Don't forget what God has spoken to you or what God has told you and walk according to you. You gotta know for yourself what God said. And then in reading God's word, it gives you his instructions. All 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, tells you what God said. You wanna know what God speak? Get it from his word. Have a relationship, an intimate relationship with him and know him for yourself. Hearing the pastor preach or hearing those other ministers preach and teach and hearing some of the things that are on the uh, World Wide Web and other areas is wonderful. But you got to know the Lord for yourself and you got to hear God for yourself. Study the word to show thyself approved. A workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. Bless you on tonight. I pray that this word has blessed somebody. I pray that this word has blessed somebody. Even, um, and I may address it on next week, the Bible got further when it, uh, Samuel told Saul, why didn't you just follow what God told you? Why didn't you do what God instructed you to do? And Samuel continued to blame it on the people. I was afraid of what the people was going to do. I was afraid of what the people, you cannot be afraid of men in their faces. When you are in charge and you are responsible, you got to do the right thing. Glory to God. Praise your name, God. Praise your name. The word of God is clear. We'll continue this word series, amen, on next week. We'll continue to hear what God will say, amen. And then we'll try to bring this to a culmination, amen, maybe next week or the following week, depending on how God continues to pour into my spirit about this word. I want you to get this word. I want you to know how important the word of God is. We need this word more than we need water. And his word is life to us. Praise your name, God. I pray this word has blessed you on tonight. Amen. I pray you have enjoyed the word. But if there's somebody out there listening to me tonight or looking at me tonight, I want you to know that God wants you to be saved. He said, I'm not, I, Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world. He came to the world to save the world. The Bible says in the book of Romans that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And thou shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible declares, thou shalt be saved. I wish I pray on tonight that you will pray that prayer. Tell the Lord you confess that you are a sinner. You believe Jesus Christ died for you. And you know, hallelujah, that he's your king. And so you want to give your life to him and follow his instructions. Amen. Until he come to take you home. Glory to God. We praise you that you prayed that prayer. Amen. Ask God to come into your life to forgive you for your sins and that you will follow him for the rest of your days. God bless you on tonight. God keep you on tonight in our prayer. Got a couple of announcements. Amen. And then we're going to let you wrap up for this evening. We want to pray. Amen. We want to pray that I know you have already downloaded the PHMBC app. I know that you go to your Google Play Store or your Apple App Store, download that app. And I know even now that you're sharing that app with your coworkers, with your friends, and with other family members so they can be a part of this great and growing church. And then we want to encourage you, while you're on our app, there's a give button. 
If you just hit that give button and begin to sow into ministry or continue to sow into ministry, uh, give your tithe and your offering, amen, so that there will always be meat and provisions in God's house, amen. And those blessings will always come back to you. And in the Bible even instructs it's more blessing to give than it is to receive. So we want to encourage you to continue to be a blessing, amen, because God bless you so that you can be a blessing. So thank you so much for what you've done in the past, and we thank you even in advance for what you'll continue to do in this 2021 year. God bless you. God keep this my prayer. My last announcement on tonight is stay encouraged, stay enthused, stay excited about next Sunday, amen, on February the 7th. We're going to be right here, amen, lifting up the name of Jesus, having a wonderful time in the Lord, celebrating us coming back in um, after one year, amen, of not having worship service. We'll be back in the first Sunday in February. We'll also have communion, amen, so come ready, come prepared to hear what God says or say unto us on that morning, amen, and we want to have a wonderful time in the Lord. Well, God bless you, God keep you, it's my prayer, and let us look forward to being dismissed on tonight. Praise your name, God. God, we bless you, and we do thank you. God, we thank you for your word, God, we thank you because your word is true, and your word is clear. So, God, we thank you for how you open up your word and how you share it with your people. We pray now, God, that that word will not just fall on their ears and it will not return to you, Lord. Bless those who received it and bless those who will hear it even at a later time. So, God, we just bless your name on tonight. God, thank you for being God. Thank you for being the Lord of our life. And thank you for being our Savior. Now, unto him who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more that we can ask our thing. To him be glory, mercy, and the in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.